This concerns the explanation of intellectual doubts raised about the belief that Allah the Almighty exists in a place and direction. The first doubt is that those who accept a direction for Allah the Almighty say that since the universe exists and Allah the Almighty exists, there are two existents, which inevitably means they must either interpenetrate or be separate from each other in one of the six directions. Since Allah the Almighty is not interpenetrated with the universe, it is necessary for him to be separate from the universe in a certain direction. Once this is established, it is then necessary for him to be in the upper direction. While saying this, some consider it self-evident, we have discussed this at the beginning of the book, while others try to prove it with evidence. Ibn Sina had chosen this approach in his debate. I will mention this doubt with a summary of its related information, in an arrangement and style that best expresses the doubt. It is said that when two existents are in a place, it is inevitable that one of them is either inside the other or in a direction outside of it. The reason for this is either because they are substances or accidents, or they have a structure common to both. This common structure is either substantiality or existence. Other causes outside of existence are invalid. Therefore, it is necessary for the cause and reason of this situation to be existence, that is, to exist. Given this, since Allah the Almighty exists, it is necessary to say that He is either inside the universe or separate from it in a certain direction. This conclusion can only be completed with certain premises that I will mention. We will discuss everything that can be mentioned in these premises. The first premise is that it is incredible to say that one of the two existents in a witness, i.e., observable place, is either inside the other or in a direction outside of it. This statement is a judgment that requires evidence. Its evidence is that this judgment is valid with existing things. If the things in which this judgment is valid did not have a distinction or privilege in a certain matter from the things in which this judgment is not valid, there would be no distinction. This means that existence have a privilege compared to non-existence. The second premise is that the cause of this judgment is not being a substance or an accident. Because if the cause were this, it would be necessary for there to be varieties of substances that are inside others and outside others. However, this is impossible because the very nature of a substance prevents it from being inside another. The cause of this judgment is not being an accident because it is not possible for an accident to be separate in a direction from something else. The third premise is that the cause of this judgment is not being created, Hudith. Its evidence is as follows. First, the existence of the world is composed of its previous non-existence. Non-existence is not included in the cause. Since non-existence has no place in this respect, only existence remains. Second, the evidence that Ibn Sina relied on in the discussion is as follows. If the cause of this judgment were to be created, then an ignorant person who does not know that the sky is created would not know whether it is interpenetrated with other things in the world or separate from them. Because if the cause of a judgment is a certain thing, it is necessary for one not to know the judgment without knowing this certain cause. Don't you see that existence is the cause of the distinction between the ancient, Kadim, and the created, Hadith, among existence? So to believe that something does not exist prevents one from saying whether it is ancient or created? Similarly, the division between black and white depends on the things being colored, so to believe that things are not colored prevents the division. However, we see that those who believe that the heavens and the earth are ancient think that they are either interpenetrated or separate from each other in a certain direction. From this, we understand that the cause of this judgment is not being created. Third, as Ibn Sina also pointed out in his debate, proving that something is created is known through evidence, while the necessity of it being interpenetrated or separate in a certain direction is known through necessity. It is not permissible for something that is known through evidence to be a quality of something known through necessity. With these explanations, 
it is established that the cause and reason of the mentioned judgment is not being created. The fourth premise is that the cause of this judgment is existence. Since Allah the Almighty exists, it is necessary for the cause of being interpenetrated with the universe or separate from it in a certain direction to also apply to him. Therefore, the mentioned judgment also applies to him. In this premise, we need to explain that existence is a single truth in both the witness, observable, and the unseen, unobservable, because if this were not so, it would necessitate that the existence of Allah the Almighty is something additional and extra to His essence. Therefore, unless this principle is established, the intended purpose will not be achieved. These are the words that can be said in the estimation of the mentioned doubt. Anyone sees the clear difference between them. In conclusion, this doubt is based on the thesis that it is necessary for one of the two existence in a witness to be either inside the other or separate from it in a certain direction. Our response to this thesis is as follows, question and answer 1. Most philosophers have not proved and accepted the existence of existence that are neither inside the physical world nor separate from it in a certain direction. Because they have accepted the celestial souls, human souls, i.e., spirits, and prime matter. And they say that these things are not contractors, they are not found within the contracting years, and they are not in a situation of being within the universe or separate from it in any direction. Therefore, until the proponents of this doubt and the related thesis prove this view of the philosophers with evidence, their statement that one of the two existence in a witness, i.e., observable place, is either inside the other or in a direction outside of it will not be valid. 2. Most of the Mutazilites have accepted the existence of wills that are not in any place, the existence of aversions, i.e., feelings of discomfort, and the absence of annihilation. However, these things are not subject to the judgment of being within a problem or separate from it in any direction. Until you prove this as well, your claim will not gain validity. 3. We prove that relations are existent things, and then we also prove that it is impossible for them to be within the universe or separate from it in any direction. This situation proves your claim. We say that relations are existing desires. For example, a person being the father of another person is something separate from that person's essence. It is possible to think of this person's essence abstractly and separately from being a father or a son. The thought thing is separate from the unthought thing. Moreover, the existence of an essence completely devoid of fatherhood and sonship is also possible. An example of this is Prophet Jesus, who is neither anyone's father nor son. A stable thing is different from an unstable thing. The mentioned relation is either a negative or an affirmative quality. The first option is invalid because the negative quality is the non-existence of fathers, while fatherhood negates this non-existence. A thing that negates non-existence is existence. This establishes that fatherhood is an existent quality separate from the father's essence. Once this is established, we say that it is impossible for fatherhood to be within the father's essence. Because if this were the case, it would be permissible to say that half of the fatherhood is in half of the father, a third in a third, which is obviously invalid. On the other hand, to say that fatherhood is separate from the father's essence in a place and direction would then mean that fatherhood must be a substance that stands by itself and is separate from the father's essence in a direction. But this is impossible because fatherhood is not a substance but an accident. With these proofs, accepting that it is either within something or separate from it in any direction would be an additional and unnecessary judgment. And this would necessitate an infinite regress. Why? Because the acceptance itself, when it does not exist, becomes non-existence. We said this because accepting division is a special acceptance. This specialty in distinction, if it were an attribute of existence, 
would necessitate the non-existence and possibility of existence. However, this is impossible. And if it is a non-existing attribute, one must judge that the non-existence of accepting is a judgment. Once the non-existence of this judgment is established, attributing a cause to it becomes impossible. Because non-existence is absolutely negative. Therefore, attributing an effect to it is impossible. Thus, it is established that attributing a cause to the acceptance of division is not possible. Third question and answer. Suppose that this judgment is a judgment. But why shouldn't it be possible to attribute it to being a substance or an accident? Because being a substance prevents interpenetration, and being an accident prevents being separate in any direction. It is also impossible for the cause of accepting division to be something that prevents one of these parts. We say, what do you mean by saying that the existent in a witness is divided into parts that are interpenetrated and separate in any direction? If you mean that the existent in a witness is divided into two parts, one of which is an accident within something and the other is a substance outside of it, then this is accepted by us. However, this actually indicates two separate judgments afflicted with two causes. Because one existent is inside something due to being an accident, and another existent is outside something due to being a substance. Thus, your statement that the existence being an accident or a substance is not a suitable cause for the judgment is invalid. Yes, if you mean that the possibility of being divided into two parts is a judgment valid for all existence in a witness, then this is invalid. Because the possibility of being divided into two parts is not valid for any existent in a witness, let alone for all existence. Because it is impossible for a substance to be inside something else and for an accident to be outside something else. Therefore, each of these is not capable of being divided into two parts. Thus, it is established that the statement of the owner of the doubt is a deception and a trick. Because he gave the impression that the statement the existent is either together with another or separate from it in a direction indicates a single judgment. Then, he built the claim that it is not possible to attribute this judgment to being a substance or an accident. However, we have explained that this statement indicates two separate judgments afflicted with two different causes. Fourth question and answer, let's accept that it is not possible to attribute this judgment to being a jewel or an accident. But why do you say that it is inevitable to attribute it to being created or existence? What is the proof of limiting the cause to these two things? The most that can be said here is this. We have investigated the causes and found no third category apart from these two. However, we have explained in our books that not finding something is not proof of its non-existence and have demolished and explained the arguments built on other common divisions that do not revolve between negation and proof. Fifth question and answer, let's accept that not finding indicates non-existence. However, we do not divide your statement we have not found any other cause for this judgment apart from creation and existence. There are two reasons for this. It is possible that the owners of the statement say, the reason we say something is either inside the universe or outside of it is because it is possible to make a sensory indication to that thing. Because when there are two things to which a sensory indication can be made, indicating one of them is either the same as or different from indicating the other. The first option is exemplified by color or the relation to being colored, which involves interpenetration. The second option involves being separate in any direction. Thus, it is established that the cause of accepting this division is being able to make a sensory indication to something. Given this, unless you provide evidence that a sensory indication can be made to it, it is not possible to say that it is necessary for Allah the Almighty to be within the universe or separate from it in any direction. However, whether or not a sensory indication can be made to Allah the Almighty is a matter of debate. Then, the validity of the desired outcome occurs, which leads to circular reasoning. 
and circular reasoning is invalid. There is no doubt that things other than Allah the Almighty are either inside or outside of each other. There is no doubt that Allah the Almighty, with his special reality, is contrary to these two parts. If they were not contrary to these, substances and accidents, they would be an example and similar to the substance or accidents. From this, it follows that he, Allah, must be created like substances and accidents. However, he is not like that. Once this is established, we say, undoubtedly, substances and accidents share with Allah the Almighty the aspect that causes opposition and separation between them. Then, why can't the cause and reason for the division into being interpenetrated or separate be this shared aspect? If this is the cause and reason, then a question arises, because the only shared aspect between substances and accidents is their creation. Sixth question and answer, let's accept the exclusive division of being interpenetrated or separate. But why shouldn't the cause and reason for this judgment be the creation? If it were said that it is composed of non-existence and existence, we would say that every wonderful thing is subject to the judgment of being capable of non-existence and existence. The division of something into being adjacent and separate means it accepts these two parts. Accordingly, if being capable is a quality of existence, it is so in both places. If non-existence is a quality, it is the same in both places. Attributing non-existence to non-existence is not a far-fetched possibility. The owner of the doubt, if he says the cause of this judgment is creation, then not knowing. Something is created would require not knowing this judgment. Against this, we say, they believe in the existence of something. However, they do not know whether it is interpenetrated with the universe or separate from it in any direction. According to this logic, it is necessary for the reason and cause of this judgment to be existence or non-existence. This question was posed by our companion Ibn Ramatullahi to Ibn Hisham, and the latter could only say this in response, knowing the cause and not knowing the effect is impossible, but knowing the effect and not knowing the cause is not impossible. He explained the difference between these two at length but he could not present a clear meaning that could be conveyed. The opponent relies on the argument that it is known without evidence whether something is interpenetrated with another or separate. To the argument that a quality requiring evidence cannot be a cause of a quality known without evidence, we say, this claim is unacceptable. It is known that the cause is the effect. Seventh question and answer let's accept that the cause of this judgment is not creation but existence. But why do you say that this judgment must be applied to Allah the Almighty? However, the desired result is only necessary if existence in the witness, observable, and the unseen, unobservable, is the same. If this is not the case, or if the use of existence for both the observable and the unobservable is only through excessive participation, then this evidence falls silent. The Karamiya, a theological group, do not have the possibility to say that existence is the same both in the observable and the unobservable. In this case, they must either say that Allah the Almighty has an exact equivalent in all aspects or that his existence is something extra and additional to his essence. However, they cannot say either of these. Eighth question and answer let's accept that what we mentioned is evidence of the judgment of existence. But there is another evidence that prevents this. This evidence is as follows, if the cause and reason for accepting the division of substances and accidents were existence, then it would be necessary for substances to accept division into substance alone and accidents into accident and substance. However, as is known, such a division is impossible. If they say that substances and accidents are divided into two parts in terms of existence, but the specificity of their natures prevents each of them from being divided into two, we would say that this statement is an admission. Because if the cause of the judgment of existence is existence, 
then this judgment must be valid for all existence characterized by existence. Because it is possible for the special nature of this existent to prevent this judgment. In this case, why can't it be said that even if the nature of an existent requires it to be inside or separate from another existent in a certain direction, the special nature of Allah the Almighty prevents this judgment? If this is acceptable, then it is not necessary for Allah the Almighty, being existent, to be inside the universe or separate from it in any direction. Fourth question and answer, the evidence you mentioned can be considered in many ways. However, the conclusion it leads to is always false, indicating that this evidence is flawed. Some of these considerations are as follows, if everything other than Allah the Almighty is created, then, according to this, the health of the created would be a common judgment among all these things. We clearly say that since this health is created, the common cause is either creation or existence. If it is creation, because creation precedes in terms of its level, it is not possible to attribute a thing that precedes to something that follows. Thus, it is established that the health is not creation. Therefore, it must be attributed to existence. Allah the Almighty also exists. Therefore, it must also be established that the health of creation applies to him, which would be impossible. In any existent in the witness, observable, it is either volumetric or dependent on volume. When we add the previous division and explanation, it inevitably leads to Allah the Almighty also being volumetric or dependent on volume. However, the Karmiya, a religious sect, do not say this either. In the case of the two existence in witness, observable reality, it is necessary that one of them is either inside the other or in any direction separated from it. Adding this to the subsequent explanation and schedule, it becomes apparent that this judgment is flawed in existence. Since Allah the Almighty exists, it then becomes necessary that He is either inside the universe or separated from it in any direction. This would necessitate that Allah the Almighty specializes in the upper direction. Even more, it would mean that Allah the Almighty must be capable of moving from up to down, but these conclusions are unacceptable according to the karmia. In the case of the two existence in witness, it is necessary for one to be inside the other or separated from it in a direction. The one that is separated in direction must also be a horizontal substance or composed of substances. In witness, an existent being one of these three parts, either an accident, a single substance, or composed, is inevitably characterized in existence. Thus, it becomes necessary for Allah the Almighty to be one of these parts. However, the Karmiya do not accept this because according to them, Allah the Almighty is neither an accident, a single substance, nor a composite body. In the case of any existent assumed to be with the universe, in terms of quantity, it is either equal to the universe, more than it, or less than it. The division of the existent in witness into these three parts is a judgment, and it requires a cause. Since Allah the Almighty exists, it becomes necessary for him to be one of these three parts. But the Karmiya do not say this. This proves that this doubt is flawed. We have dwelled on this doubt at length because the Karmiya rely on it and claim it to be a strong, crushing evidence. Therefore, we have compiled and presented it, then put forward these questions and concise objections. We pray to the Almighty Allah that He makes these investigations and examinations a means for the increase of reward and grace. The second doubt, the Karamites, to prove that Allah the Almighty is in a direction, have said, it is established that the vision, sight, of Allah the Almighty is permissible, and seeing something necessitates it being in a position like facing. This leads to the necessity of Allah the Almighty being in a direction. The Mutazilites and Karamites agree that everything seen must be in a direction. However, the Mutazilites say that Allah the Almighty is not in a direction, therefore, his being seen is not obligatory. 
The Karamites say that Allah the Almighty can be seen, therefore, his being in a direction is obligatory. Our companions do not find this premise and method of reasoning correct and criticize it by saying, we do not accept the necessity of everything seen being in a direction. It may be so in witness, but why do you claim that what is so in witness must also be so in the unseen? The explanation of this is as follows, the mentioned premise is either self-evident or deductive. If it is self-evident, there is no need to advance it to prove that Allah the Almighty is in a direction. Then, it would suffice to say, it is established that everything self-subsistent in witness is in a direction, Allah the Almighty is self-subsistent, therefore, it is obligatory to judge definitively that he is in a direction. Because the judgment established in witness is fundamentally the same in the unseen according to correct knowledge. If stating this is sufficient to prove that Allah the Almighty is in a direction, then his being in a direction is also sufficient for his being seen to be established. Therefore, trying to prove afterward that everything seen is in a direction is unnecessary verbosity that does not require further explanation or elaboration. But if we say that the judgment of every seen thing being in a direction is not self-evident but deductive, then unless they bring evidence that it is indeed so, this premise does not become a definitive premise. Then we do not think that something can be seen unless it is in a position like facing the seer in witness, nor do we think it can be seen unless it is extended or composed of parts in small or large dimensions. However, the proponents of the doubt say that Allah the Almighty is not seen in this state. If it is permissible to say these things, why is it not permissible to say that the seen and the unseen does not have to be like facing the seer, despite the necessity of the seen and witness being so? The third doubt, the proponents of the doubt have focused on raising hands towards the sky during prayer and have said, followers of all religions pray in this manner. This shows that the idea that Allah the Almighty is in the upper direction has settled in the minds of all people. However, this is the greatest consensus and unanimity. The response, just as all these people have settled in their minds the reverence of placing foreheads on the ground for Allah the Almighty, it does not indicate that Allah is on the ground, just as what they said does not indicate He is in the sky. Then, People raise their hands in that direction not because they believe Allah is in the sky but for other reasons. These reasons are as follows, the most beneficial thing to people is light and illumination, which appear in the upper direction, the lights of the sun, moon, and stars come from above. Secondly, human life is based on breathing, which involves taking air from above, since the air is above, the upper direction is superior to the lower. Thirdly, rain descends from above, these beneficial things coming from the sky direction make that direction inevitably more honorable, and the mind and knowledge tend to what is more honorable. Raising hands towards the sky is for this reason. Then, just as Allah the Almighty has made the Kaaba the Qibla for our prayers, He has also made the throne the Qibla for our supplications. Moreover, Allah the Almighty has made angels the means of ensuring the welfare of this world. Verses in the Quran describing those who conduct affairs and distribute tasks refer to angels. Followers of the religion have also reached consensus that Gabriel is the angel of revelation and prophecy, Michael is the angel of sustenance, and Azrael is the angel of death. There are also common beliefs regarding other angels. Therefore, the purpose of raising hands towards the sky could also be to open them towards the angels, which is not a far-fetched possibility.